What's up? Welcome to Crash Course AP Environmental Science Edition. Make sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Biomes. Biomes are large distinct terrestrial regions around the world that have similar climates, soils, plants, and animals. They are usually arranged by different latitudes and different types of climates found in these regions. So some common ones are the tropical rainforest located around the equator, temperate forests located in North America and Europe, the desert, which is about 30 degrees north and south, tundras, which is northern regions, and right below that, the taigas, the boreal needle-like forests, and also grasslands and savannas found throughout Africa and Asia, and even Australia, and other types of arctic regions around the poles. Producers, also known as autotrophs versus consumers and heterotrophs. So producers are organisms that produce their own food. Usually they use the sun because the sun gives us a lot of energy or they use chemiosynthesis, which is using chemical processes to create energy. You usually find these in deep areas of the sea where there isn't much sunlight. And consumers are organisms that consume other organisms to get their food. So humans are heterotrophs. Symbiotic relationship. This describes the close interaction between species in which one species lives in or on another. Mutualism is when both species benefit, so this could be like in Nemo, where the sea anemone gets food from the fish and the fish is given protection by the sea anemone. Commensalism is when one benefits and one is neither harmed nor benefited, so this one example of this could be like a tree and a frog, where a, the tree provides a habitat for the frog but doesn't really get anything back in return. And parasitism is when one is harmed and one is helped. So this could be like a worm in a mammal because the worm is feeding off the mammal but the mammal is being harmed in the process. Succession. These are the gradual and orderly processes of change in an ecosystem when there is a replacement of different types of species, and this happens until a stable climax community is established. So there are two types, primary and secondary. Primary starts when you have bare bones rocks, so this could be like from a volcano formation, while secondary usually occurs after you have different natural disasters, such as a forest fire comes in and wipes everything out. Carrying capacity. This describes the number of individuals that can be sustained in an area. Usually you see it in a graph. So here, over time, we see the number of rabbits starts to peak and the environment they're living in cannot support as many. So the rabbit population starts to level off and this leveling off is where the carrying capacity is. Positive feedback loop. This is when a change in some condition triggers a response that intensifies the changing condition. So one example could be different types of climate change and global warming because you have a warmer earth and more snow will melt so less sunlight is reflected and more is absorbed so because of albedo and therefore you have a warmer type of earth. And so in this type of process, things that are going good can get much better and things that are going bad will get much worse. On the opposite hand, you have a negative feedback loop. This is when a change in some condition triggers a response that counteracts the change condition. So the best example is homeostasis and temperature control in the body, because if your body gets too warm or too cold, it will start to go back and alter the temperature, so it will maintain that around 98.6 degrees. BOD. BOD is standing for Biological oxygen demand it is the amount of dissolved oxygen that is needed by aerobic decomposers to break down different types of organic materials. So different species and organisms will demand different levels of oxygen. Hypoxia is when aquatic plants die and the BOD suddenly rises because aerobic decomposers start to come in and break down the plants. And these decomposers, of course, they have to use a lot of the DO in the water. And as a result, the DO starts to drop and the water cannot support as many types of species such as fish. Eutrophication. This is the rap rapid algal growth that is caused by an excess of different types of nutrients such as nitrates, NO3, and phosphates, PO4, and different types of water. So this is an example of cultural eutrophication 
where different types of fertilizers such as nitrogen are dumped into the water by anthropogenic causes so that's like humans and it starts to cause these different types of eutrophication keystone species these are species that influence their survival of other species in an ecosystem and they're very important so one example is a sea otter in marine ecosystems because if they do not control the sea urchin population urchins will dominate indicator species these are species that serve as early warnings that an ecosystem is being damaged. So one example is trout and other fish in streams. So if a stream doesn't have much dissolved oxygen, these types of fish will start to show in their population numbers. Invasive, alien, and exotic species. These are non-native species to an area, and oftentimes they thrive and disrupt the ecosystem balance because they don't have natural predators to control them. So examples include kudzu, the African honey killer bee, the fire ant, and even the zebra mussel. All of these, of course, were not really native to North America at one point. The tragedy of the commons. This is a description about how the global commons, such as the atmosphere and especially the oceans, are used by all and owned by none. So right now we have a big tragedy of the commons with fishing in the world. The fisheries are being depleted because no one is really regulating how much different types of fishermen can take. And as a result, many of the global fish supplies have started to go down. Competitive exclusion principle. This is an ecological rule that states that no two species can occupy the same exact niche in the same habitat at the same time. If two species start to do this, bad things will happen, So, such as these monkeys starting to fight. So usually species will either adapt to the new conditions, move away, or die through different competition. Resource partitioning. This is the division of environmental resources by coexisting species, so that the niche of one species differs by one or more significant factors from the niches of other species. So different types of nesting birds, they might start to mate and have different types of birds at different times in the year. So these birds aren't competing with the species of other birds for different types of food and habitat. 10% rule. This is a rule derived from thermodynamics, and it states that only 10% of the total energy produced at each trophic level is available at the next trophic level. So the amount of energy passed when you start to go up the food pyramid is reduced. So at the bottom, you have producers. They have a lot of calories produced, but by the time you get up to like the tertiary consumers, they only have a little bit. And unfortunately for humans, this is also kind of bad because we're at the top, of course, so we have to eat a lot to get our energy needs. Nitrogen cycle. This is the transfer of nitrogen from the atmosphere to the soil to different types of living organisms, such as humans, and back to the atmosphere. So here is just a diagram. Basically, nitrogen is available in many different forms. Some of it is usable and some not. So there's some in the atmosphere, and that's not usable but different plants can take it in as can different types of bacteria in the soil through processes like assimilation, ammonification, and nitrification to make this nitrogen useful so plants can then absorb it and of course different animals can eat these plants or we can eat these plants to gain the nitrogen that we need in our body. And legumes are different types of plants that naturally can start to fix nitrogen and one example would be like soybeans. GPP versus NPP. So GPP stands for gross primary production and NPP stands for net primary production. So gross is the total that's totally produced by any plant that is respirating and net primary production is the GPP minus respiration and different types of maintenance that the plants have to go through. So plants can produce different types of things through photosynthesis, but they have to breathe too. And that's how you get the net value. Species richness versus species evenness. So these are two important terms. Richness describes the number of different species represented in an ecological community, landscape, or region. So in community one, you have different type, you have more of an evenness. Oops, let's take a look at the definition first. So evenness describes how close in numbers that each species is 
in, envi in an environment is. So in community one, you see that the different types of trees is much more even. There's 25% of each. However, in community two, you have much more richness in one type of plant. So in species A of tree, you have much more dominating at 80%. Conservationists like Theodore Roosevelt wanted to allow the use of resources like trees in a responsible manner. So logging was allowed, but as long as you weren't using too much of it, it was fine. Preservationists like John Muir wanted to set aside different areas and protect them from different types of human activities. So this ultimately led to the creation of things like the National Forest. The theory of island biogeography. This is a theory that demonstrates the importance of habitat size and distance in determining species richness. So the farther away you go from the mainland, you're going to have less species in isolated places because of course it's harder for these species to get there in the first place. Survivorship curve. This is a graph showing the number of survivors in different types of different age groups for a particular species. So you have R-selected species that have high initial growth and K-selected species like humans which have lower growth and tend to survive until later years. And then you have like things like squirrels who survive in middle age groups. So the chance of them living long is about the same chance as them living short. Turbidity. This is a measure of how clear water is. So the more suspended solids there are in a water sample, the less transparent it is, and thus more turbid, like this picture over here. Biomagnification versus bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulation refers to how pollutants enter a food chain. So in this case, it shows that over time, a certain school of fish, as they grow older, they are going to have more contaminant levels built up in their bodies. So these are saying the same species. Biomagnification, on the other hand, refers to the tendency of pollutants to concentrate as they move from one trophic level to the next. So in this case, we're going from plankton to the polar bear. As these toxins start to move through the food chain, they start building up as well. The demographic transition model so this is a sequence of demographic changes in which a country moves from high birth and death rates to low birth and death rates over time. It generally has around four stages. You have the high initial stage where not many countries are in, and then you have the early expanding stage, stage two. Uh, different countries want to go through this rate very fast because you have high birth, but you have less death. So then you would have a population boom and that's not too great. And then you have the late expanding period where you start to decrease in birth rates and you already start to have a lower death rate. And then low stationary, these are developed countries like the United States where we have lower birth and death relatively. Crude birth and death rate, these are also measures of human population. So this number tells the number of deaths or births per 1,000 individuals per year. This really shows how much a country is growing. If you're having a lot of birth but low death, you're going to have an increasing population. And if you have high death and low birth, you're going to start having a decreasing population overall. Although things like immigration can change rates. Replacement level fertility. This is the number of children a couple must have to replace themselves. So in developed countries where most people start to live longer, it's 2.1. So that's the rate to replace both the mom and the dad. Doubling time. This is, this is a statistic called the rule of 70, and it's basically 70 divided by the percent growth rate. No need to convert it because it's already given to you in a percent. And this tells how long it's going to take for a certain population to double in their total population. IPAT. This is a formula that talks about the impact of humans on the environment. So impact equals population times affluence times technology. So when you have larger populations, you're going to have a bigger impact on the environment and also affluence, as you see here in different types of the world. If people are more rich, they're more likely to buy different things and that's going to create more of an impact on the environment and also technology, such as things that have come after the industrial revolution have also had a big impact on the environment. Bycatch. This is the unintentional catch of non-target species while fishing. So in the world right now, we see a big problem with catching things like turtles and dolphins when fishermen are trying to fish, and this of course is not good. 
CAFO. This stands for a concentrated animal feeding operation. This is how most of the meat in the United States is raised these days. It's basically a large feedlot that's one goal is to fatten animals really quick with the fewest amount of resources possible before they are slaughtered and then of course packaged and sent to supermarkets across America. This of course has very bad impacts on environments around the country because of things like manure lagoons which are big lakes basically filled with cow poop and stuff. IPM. This is integrated pest management. It is a program used to keep pests from entering and establishing themselves and also to eliminate any pests that do get in. Many times this is working with different things like pesticides and fertilizers but also incorporating some of the natural processes like genetics and biology to fight off these types of pests. Well, that's it for this one. Part two is over here on the left and you can find the full AP playlist over there on the right. Make sure to subscribe, like, comment, and share with your friends. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you in the next one.